I know Martinsville Speedway is known for creating rivalries, known for causing tempers to spill over, but we have quite a few drivers, many of them playoff drivers, who were pretty upset with each other after last night's race. Let's talk about that and a whole lot more. It's the Martinsville Race Review episode. <laughs> How's it going, y'all? My name is Eric, and welcome to Out of the Groove. Yesterday was the Martinsville Cup race, the first race of the round of eight. I know I'm uploading this a day later, so I know the tempers aren't flaring as much. People's blood isn't boiling quite as much as if, I, as if I was uploading this right after the race. But now that we've had a little bit of time to sleep on it, think about it, some other little reports have come out here and there, some fallout from the tension, the drama we saw this weekend, I think today's episode's gonna be a pretty good one. I have a lot of thoughts that I wanna share with you guys, a lot of things I wanna cover, so let's just get to it. I don't wanna waste too much time here just talking. We're gonna go to flash up the top 20 finishing results here for a moment, but I'm not really gonna talk about every single driver like I usually do. A couple quick shout outs though. William Byron finishing second. One of the most, probably the most impressive performance I've seen from him in his young career. A lot of times William Byron, he qualifies on the pole, qualifies up front, and then just fades and runs 15th. This was the opposite. He was still very strong, very much in contention at the very end of this race. He was close to, if not as good as Martin Truex Jr. on those final runs, and uh, and I think that deserves to be credited. Also want to shout out David Reagan, Chris Buescher, and Bubba Wallace, three good drivers on not so great of race teams that got very solid performances, very good solid finishes from this race. Also want to shout out Corey LaJoy in the Mystery Machine paint scheme, finishing 18th, very strong performance for that race team. So those are just some shout outs I wanted to do, but now we have to talk about the top story from yesterday's race that I'm sure everyone wants to talk about. We're just gonna start out with it here. Here, we gotta talk about the fight, the brawl. So Denny Hamlin and Joey Logano definitely have some history together. You know, they were teammates for a few years there when Logano first came into the Cup Series. They were both teammates over at Joe Gibbs Racing. And then the first year Logano left to go to Penske, remember 2013 at Bristol, they had a little bit of an altercation there. Obviously Fontana, they had an issue there, the wreck at the last lap that ultimately led to Hamlin being injured. So 2013 was not a great year for their relationship. Hamlin's had run-ins with other drivers at Team Penske. Hamlin's teammates have often had run-ins with drivers at Team Penske. So Joey Logano, Denny Hamlin definitely don't see eye to eye on very much. And they got into it again late in the race at Martinsville and tempers spilled over onto pit road as they often do at this racetrack. So as far as the on-track incident is concerned, late in this race, about 40 laps to go, Denny Hamlin was racing underneath. Joey Logano seemed to run him up wide on the exit of the corner and actually seemed to force Logano into the wall a little bit. Didn't give Joey Logano enough room, squeezed him into the fence, and that ended up cutting a tire down and hurting Joey Logano's finish. So in my opinion, Logano had every right to be frustrated with Hamlin. Both those drivers are racing for their playoff lives. They're both trying to make it to Homestead. Neither of them were locked in, and with the way the round of eight points were set up, they're both pretty close to the cut line at that point. Points really matter. These first few rounds for some of these guys like Hamlin and Logano, points have, haven't mattered too much yet because they had a lot of playoff points coming in. This round, points matter for pretty much everyone. Uh, so I, I completely understand why Joey Logano was frustrated and went to confront Hamlin after the race. When he confronted Hamlin, that's when things went a little bit crazy here. You see it here on the replay. Uh, Hamlin kind of put his hand out. Logano slapped it away and immediately turned and walked away. That led to Hamlin trying to chase him down. Crew guys immediately got involved, as has become the theme recently. Uh, you see Hamlin actually gets drugged to the ground by this cheap shot from this 22 crew guy. We'll have more on that in a minute. Uh, and that was basically the fight. The two drivers were separated. They actually came back together briefly a little bit later, had a few more words, tried to shove each other again, and then that was basically it. And then afterwards, Denny Hamlin delivered this joy of a quote. You probably say, yeah, it's your track race. Beautiful impression of Joey Logano. That is Logano. I mean, remember last year, Martinsville knocked Truex out of the way. I thought it was a little bit of an agreement just bump and run just because Truex had raced him cleanly for 10 laps beforehand, beat him straight up, and for Logano to immediately run through him on the very next corner, I thought was a little much, but hey, a win's a win, and Logano did what he had to do, but that was Logano's quote afterwards. It's just short track racing. Denny Hamlin, genius. I love that. As far as analyzing the fight itself, it's your typical NASCAR driver fight. The two guys get mad at each other, get in each other's faces, shove each other a couple times, and then almost immediately the big crew dudes are involved and break it up before anything can really happen. Nobody really gets hurt here. However, it is interesting Thing, this 22 crew guy that pulls Hamlin down, this once again reminds us of you know, last week's incident between Cole Custer and Tyler Reddick. I did a whole video where I talked about this. I talked about last week how I think crew guys should be penalized if they escalate fights like this. I think if two drivers start a fight with each other, more or less, they should be the ones to finish it. I think the NASCAR officials need something to do. When they're sitting around on pit road there, they're doing pretty much nothing. They're looking at lug nuts. That's all they're doing. They should be there to break up the fights. Don't let the crew guys, I don't like the crew guys immediately swarming and making these things a bigger mess than they need to be. Let the drivers finish it. And if the drivers, if one of the drivers does finish it, that's when the officials, I think, should be the first people to step in. I understand the tendency, the crew guys want to protect their drivers, so I get it. So that's why if they do come in there and try to break it up, that's fine. My problem is if crew guys start trying to escalate the fight here, and that's kind 
kind of what I thought Stuart Haas Racing guys did to Tyler Reddick in the Xfinity Series fight last weekend, and that's exactly what this 22 crew guy did here to Hamlin. He just comes out of nowhere. Hamlin obviously doesn't see him coming, just blindsides him, yanks him to the ground. Uh, Steve O'Donnell uh, indicated after the race that there probably will be a penalty for that crew guy after that, so I think that's fair. Good to see NASCAR stepping in and kind of taking a stand, saying, hey, there is a line here, and this crew guy crossed it. Definitely, if you're a pit crew guy and you're not initially involved in the fight, you shouldn't be going and doing little sneak attacks like that. That is wrong. So I hope he gets penalized. Probably will, it sounds like. Uh, but that's my overall analysis of the fight. Logano, Hamlin, both acting kind of childish, in my opinion. Hamlin uh, putting his hand out there and starting the fight kind of just childish. But Joey Logano slapping him and then turning and walking away is also childish. If you slap a guy, he's going to come after you. You should know that, Joey Logano. So just kind of childish in general. But it's tempers, it's heat of the moment. People don't always think rationally or think the way they normally would. So i it just is what it is. It's still very entertaining for the fans. Typical Martinsville. But now there's one driver who was watching this fight, probably with the biggest grin on his face he could possibly muster, watching it from Victory Lane. Martin Truex Jr. I haven't even talked about him yet. I barely mentioned his name yet in this video. He won the race in dominating fashion. His third win of the playoffs was it his seventh win of the year, I think, or is it his eighth? Honestly, I think it's a, I think it's his seventh. And he did it in dominating fashion. Typical Martin Truex Jr. win. When Martin Truex Jr. wins a race, more often than not, he just dominates these things. Think about the. Coke 600 a couple years ago, infamous race where he led almost all of the 600 miles. This race here this weekend, uh, he once again led almost every lap. 464 laps led out of 500. That's like the most amount of laps led in a Martinsville race in the modern era, something like that. Got his revenge, I guess you could say, for last year's race when he got bumped out of the way, finished second. He gets his revenge, punches his ticket to Homestead. Uh, he has established himself now as the clear championship favorite. It's Homestead, obviously anything can happen, but he is the driver now that's going to have the longest, the most amount of time to prepare for it, and I think he's the driver right now with the most momentum and the coolest head and I think that is very important when we go into a high pressure high stakes race like Homestead you need a cool head cool heads will prevail and Martin Truex Jr. is cool as a freaking cucumber right now man he didn't face hardly any pressure all night long didn't make any mistakes it was just a dominating win. I mean, you look at these playoffs right now, he has six finishes inside the top seven. The only finish in these playoffs he has outside the top seven was Talladega, and what can you do there? No, out of your control at that point. He's clearly the championship favorite right now, and he's smiling because if you look at his competition, you look at the guys we've talked about all season as the top championship contenders, they're all in turmoil right now. On the track, off the track, it's all a mess. Look at Kyle Busch, the guy that I think for most of this year, especially early on, we thought was a championship favorite. He's a mess right now. Not in championship form, completely in his own head. Uh, you look at the first seven races of these playoffs, he only has three top tens. Top tens, that's not top fives, that's top tens, only three in seven races. He's only led laps in two playoff races so far, and one of them was Talladega, so. And you can just see Kyle Busch off the track is also, he's just in his own head. He's grumpy wherever he goes. I don't know what's up with him right now, but he's just getting into it every single week with somebody. Whether he's short with the media members every other week, he was doing that again this week a little bit. He's had run-ins with Garrett Smithley. He's had run-ins now with Eric Almarola this week. Eric Almarola pledged after today's race that he was going to make it hell for Kyle Busch the rest of these playoffs. So he's getting, he's been having run-ins with Eric Almarola. Even back in the summer, he had that run-in with Bubba Wallace at Watkins Glen. He's having issues with everybody almost every single week. And it's just not... That's not good. If you're a championship contender, we're getting to the late portions of the season and your hit list is just growing because people are madder and madder and angry at you and you're angry and angry and angry at them, that's just not cool. I think cooler heads will prevail. Kyle Busch is a great, great driver, but he's always been a hothead. And in my opinion, that's why he only has one championship despite making it to the championship for, what, all five years this playoff format's existed? He's one for five. Kyle Busch is better than one and four at Homestead. This is like Michael Jordan being six and oh in the finals. Kyle Busch is one and four in the finals. That is not good. And I think it's because he's a hothead. You gotta be a little bit of cool head. You gotta be able to be cool and composed under pressure. And Kyle Busch often isn't. So Kyle Busch, he's in turmoil. Denny Hamlin. He's been running great this year. This is his best chance at a championship since he choked that one away in 2010. And he just won last weekend at Kansas, which I think is very good news looking ahead to Homestead because they're both mile and a halfs. But now this week, he's fallen back into some of his old bad habits. Remember 2017, he got into that incident with Chase Elliott and that cost him. At Phoenix, that ended up costing him. Here he is again, you know, making the mistake, running Logano into the wall, now getting into a fight with Logano, making these silly faces. Hamlin's in his own head again. This is his problem. Hamlin's not a, he's a hothead as well. And that's why he doesn't have a championship in my opinion. And this is his best shot he's had in a decade. You can't throw this in away, Denny Hamlin. You cannot let these off the track or just these distractions get in your way. And if I'm Martin Truex Jr. and I'm seeing Hamlin getting distracted, I'm like, whew, there's another guy I might not have to worry about. Obviously, when we get to Homestead, he's gonna have to beat three other drivers. Doesn't matter who they are, he's gonna have to beat three other drivers and anything can happen because it's one race. 
Right now, Martin Turks Jr. is gonna be feeling pretty good. He's gonna sleep easy the next two weeks, I think. Speaking of those point settings, let's look at them really quick. So Turex is locked in. Hamlin is pretty well off right now just because all those playoff points. Kyle Busch, too, still in a pretty good spot. They're, those two guys are really still resting on their playoff points right now. Logano's in a decent spot. You see a pretty big gap back to Kevin Harvick. I think Chase Elliott's the only driver right now in a must-win scenario. His team had a, just a terrible weekend this week by no fault of Chase. You know, broken axle in the race, obviously blew an engine in practice, put themselves behind the eight ball early. Kind of crazy that Hendrick, man, has one car in the playoffs and they can't even get that one car to have equipment that doesn't break. Uh, but yeah, Blaney, Larson, Texas is going to be huge for them. Ryan Blaney, you remember, was leading at Texas in the spring when he blew an engine or had a mechanical failure. So could be a big weekend for Blaney. But right now, those top four have separated themselves just a little bit. Now, I've done a lot of talking about a lot of the big incidents, especially the playoff-related incidents from this race. But now let's talk a little bit about the race itself. Uh, let's put this thing on the groovy gauge. We saw this in the spring race at Martinsville a little bit. You know, this aero package, mainly the big rear spoiler definitely hurts the racing at Martinsville a little bit. Makes it a little bit harder to pass, I should say. Martinsville has always been a very tough track to pass on, but you just look. Brad Keselowski in the spring led like 440 laps. You know, Martin Truex Jr. to this week led 460 laps. It's just hard to pass. The closer you get to the front, it's harder and harder to pass the leader. Now, obviously, Truex in this race had the best car, I think. I don't think really anyone was there to challenge him all race long, so of course he's going to lead most laps. Didn't make any mistakes. Of course he's going to lead most of the laps, but we saw it in the spring. We saw it in this race. It is harder to pass, and it's largely due to the spoiler. They're running 750 horsepower, same as they did last year, so it's not the horsepower. It's not the car itself. I think it's the spoiler is the number one factor at this track specifically. I still, that being said, still thought it was a pretty good race. The bump and run comes into play. Still a lot of great racing from second, third, fourth on back just not a lot of good racing for the lead and that is a ding in my book and something that NASCAR I think needs to look at going especially looking at 2021 with the next gen car uh, they need to look at that I think the big rear spoiler could be an issue at tracks like Martinsville going forward but talking about this race specifically I'm going to give it a 60% on the groovy gauge it was an above average race but not an amazing race I think some of the playoff drama and some of the drama at the end of this race some excitement towards the end of this thing definitely boosted it up there but it's a long race these Martinsville races man 500 laps feels like it's four and a half hours a lot of times four hour races man love that it finished under the lights makes me excited for next year's night race we're going to see in the spring. That's going to be super duper fun. Uh, but overall, not a bad race, just you know, not exactly what we're used to seeing from Martinsville. Still a good one. I still love Martinsville, still want more short tracks, but that big rear spoiler definitely is a little bit of an issue at times. So uh, I'll give it a 60%. Let me know what you guys think down in the description, in the comments, I should say. What did you guys think of this weekend's Martinsville race? Where would you rate it on your groovy gauge? I feel like I have so much more I could say about this race. I definitely have some stuff I want to catch up on from earlier this weekend. I got a lot of news, a lot of speculation, a lot of exciting things I want to talk about in videos later this week, but I will save that for then. For now, this video is over. Thank you guys for watching. I appreciate the support. Remember to follow me on Instagram, follow me on Twitter, and a big thank you, of course, to my Patreon supporters. My Michael Harrison, at you is the stars, Cameron James, John Coburns, Jason R. Long, Wesley Donaldson, Isaac Danson, Mika Suzuki, iFantasyRace.com, TheRacingInsiders.com, Matthew Kulapos, Pepe Lucius, Jeremy Conkling, Joey DiMaccino, Emilio Garcia, Sky Racing Forms, Bryce Schumacher, Bryce Starcher, Colton Austin, Scott McNew, Bradley Pelletier, and the rest of these incredible Patreon supporters. Couldn't do this without the support I get from you guys every single month, every single week. Continue to add new names there, so that's super duper awesome. Thank you guys for your continued support. Like I said, I've got a couple other videos planned this week. If you missed it this last Friday, I uploaded a fun video. My girlfriend was here. We were quizzing her NASCAR knowledge because two and a half years ago, she knew nothing about NASCAR being around me so much. She knew a little bit. She was, it was fun. It was very impressive. So go check that video out if you missed it. A lot of fun over there. But we got some more regular Out of the Group episodes coming up very soon later this week. Got a lot I want to talk about, and I'm excited to do it. So thanks for watching this episode, and I will see you guys again very, very soon.